Hello there, welcome to a special feature here on Sky F1. My name is Ted Kravitz. Now, if you've ever watched a Formula One race on the TV and looked at the engineers, the brain boxes on the pit wall or in the garages and thought, do you know what? I'd like to be what, where they are. I'd like to do what they're doing. Well, we have a feature here to help you. We're joined by two key personnel from one of the top Formula One teams on the grid. From Alfa Romeo Racing Orland, otherwise known as Sauber, it's Chevy Pujola and Ruth Buscombe. Hello, both. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, Ruth. Uh, hi, Chevy. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, um, where should we start? Uh, I would normally go ladies first, but considering that Ruth, Chevy's job is kind of, well, it, it flows down to, to your job, if you see what I mean. Let's start, let's start with Chevy. Chevy, give us a, a, a description of what your day-to-day -day role is and what you do. So as a head of uh, track engineering, I've got just uh, the overview of, uh, of the race team. And my, uh, my main task is just trying to extract the, the best performance of the team uh, when we are track side, just overseeing the, the performance of the, the two cars and then uh, liaising with, uh, with the factory. That's mainly uh, the, the task. Okay, and as I say, if, if, if Antonio Giovinazzi or Kimi Raikkonen are doing particularly well, or maybe sometimes mm -hmm. particularly badly on TV, we do get a shot of, uh, of, of the uh, Alfa Romeo racing uh, all in Sauber team pit wall. And almost always next to you, Chevy, is Ruth Buscombe. Um, and as head of strategy, Ruth, explain what that is and what you're doing up there. Uh, working with Chevy and the two race engineers. So what you're seeing uh, when you're looking on the pit wall is actually just uh, the tip of the iceberg really of what you do as race strategy. So you obviously get to see um, the race strategy in the race, um, but my job is more than just looking at the, the race itself. We have to do strategy in terms of qualifying strategy, tyre selection, um, how we uh, run the race weekend, trying to give as much information as possible on our competitors, um, both to people like Chevy um, and also to the race engineers in order to help make the best possible decision making. Okay, so obviously preparation makes perfect. What about the day-to-day -day roles at the factory uh, then for both of you? Um, I mean, the exciting stuff, Ruth, first is, is when you're making decisions on the fly and you're saying, oh, can I undercut this person? Can I, I overcut them or whatever? But, but does a lot of the work start back at the factory? Yeah, so strategy is um, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, 98% preparation and then 2% of it is actually the exciting part that you get to see on the TV. So what we're doing at the factory, it's a mix of um, post-race analysis, pre-race analysis, uh, tool improvement, trying to improve our own understanding of certain elements of the race, uh, potentially looking at different modelling techniques to see if we can uh, come up with a better way of, of, of modelling the strategy, and which in turn helps us make better decisions. And Chevy, how much factory stuff do you have to do? Are you in there every Monday after a race and uh, is it fairly full on? Yeah, it's quite a, a lot of activities going on during uh, the week. We've got between races a week or more. And basically first we need to analyze what has happened during the race weekend. So we need to coordinate all the different analyses in the different areas. And then simultaneously we keep working and uh, preparing the, the following event and trying to uh, chase up all the design improvements, all the air upgrades, and then we'll, we'll start to prepare a lot of uh, simulation work as well to see what will be the configuration, the car configuration uh, we need for the next event and how we will distribute all the tests. So that week is, gets quite, uh, quite busy with uh, meetings with different groups in the factory and uh, just distributing all the, all the tasks within the group. Okay, so how did you both get started? Growth first. Chevy, first of all, how did you both get started? <laughs> yeah, me, okay. <laughs> So after, even since I was a child, for me, it was clear that uh, my target was to be in motorsport. Even if uh, at the beginning, my dream was motorbikes, because uh, being based in Spain, motorbikes was uh, everywhere. You know, people either racing or driving motorbikes. So my dream was to uh, design and compete with my own motorbike. Um, but then uh, I couldn't achieve that one. So after university, I, um, I had the opportunity to join a go-kart team and that's how uh, I got into, uh, into motorsport, okay? 
and my goal was uh, Formula One, either to achieve the top of uh, the scale in uh, motorbikes, that was uh, MotoGP or 500cc, or Formula One. And once I had the opportunity to start in a go car, then I decided to keep on the four wheels and uh, follow the the Formula One uh, route. For me, it was uh, you know when I go back, that was in '94. At that time, internet was uh, not many uh, opportunities. It's not like now, no social media, uh, no mobile phones. So how from Spain? How? Can I contact the Formula One team? Or how can I meet someone in a top level of a motorsport? That was the main difficulty. And I thought that going in go-kart and trying to go international, uh, I did the European and World Championship. At some point in the paddock, I will meet someone uh, from uh, another country with a higher level of a motorsport and from there another one. And that will bring me to, uh, to F1. And it took some time, but that's how uh, I achieved it. I followed all the steps from Gokar, from Nissan F3000, and I joined F1 in 2002. And which teams have you worked for in the paddock? In F1, I've been in uh, Jaguar, Williams, HRT, Toro Rosso, and uh, Sauber Alfa Romeo. Okay, so wide breadth of, uh, of experience there. and. Um, Ruth, uh, judging from your accent, and I think people will know you, uh, uh, you're not from Spain. Um, how did you start? <laughs> what was your route into, uh, into motorsport? Uh, so my route um, was, maths is basically the short answer. Uh, and the longer answer is I always loved Formula One. I always wanted um, to work in Formula One, where a house where it was on on the Sundays. And when I realised you could do maths and be able to use that to make cars go quick, that was it for me. So I was from that point. I always wanted to work in Formula One and I wanted to be um, an engineer. For me, um, you know, I had had the internet um, and so I was able to look up and see and also from actually reading autosport and things like that, where a lot of the technical directors in the UK had gone to university. So about the age of 11, I decided that I wanted to go to Cambridge University because that's where people like Paddy Lowe and James Allison had gone. Um, and so it just seemed a case of similar to what Chevy described of that was the route. They're very good. I'll try and do that. Seemed like the most sensible path to take. Um, so that's what I did. Studied lots of maths um, at A levels um, and physics, which is very important if you want to go and do an engineering degrees these days. Um, and then went and read um, actually aerospace and aerothermal engineering at Cambridge. Um, Cambridge is a really interesting course because you get to do quite a lot of different wide aspects of engineering so even within that I was able to study mechanical engineering as well um, and then my real kind of let's say break into Formula One was um, my master's thesis which I did with a visiting professor uh, who's a guy called Tony Pennell who uh, used to be the um, uh, team principal of uh, Jaguar actually back when Chevy was there um, more about the sport world um, he was my professor and we um, did a master's thesis um, on the DRS um, with the FIA um, and through that um, project I was able to kind of get quite a few contacts um, in Formula One um, going in and bugging them for information um, which was actually uh, fascinating and really interesting um, and then through that I was able to get my first job in Formula One at Scuderia Ferrari. Good place to start. Um, how much did you find, presumably on your courses through Cambridge and then all of those places, did, did you find that you were one of the few people who had a fairly laser target on sharp, laser sharp focus on your target of what you wanted to do? Were there people doing your course or, or even Ruth people at school who didn't really know what to do and how much did it help to have that sharp focus on what you wanted to do in your career? For me, I would say it was, it was definitely an advantage. I had lots of friends um, at school and at university that didn't know what they uh, particularly wanted to do. And a lot of those people have gone on to do have really successful and varied careers. Um, by the time I got to Cambridge, I'd say that there was uh, quite a lot of people, um, certainly from the United Kingdom, people that had um, come to do a degree from other places in Europe, um, where it was quite easy to come across um, when I was there. 
and they um, were focused on Formula One, um, part of the Formula Student uh, Project at our Cambridge University. We were kind of a bit more like Hesketh. Um, people expected us to be great because we were Cambridge, but we were like Hesketh without the win. We were terrible. Um, but that was a really good networking opportunity. And there's so many people um, from that one really quite rubbish Formula Student team that's since grown and got significantly, uh, significantly bigger. Um, and better that um, are now in something like we had nine Formula One teams and three engine manufacturers the last uh, time we had a reunion dinner. So um, all of those people that really were focused on it um, are now actually working in Formula One. So who was the Bubbles Horsley and who was the James Hunt in the team? Or dare oh, I, I don't, not ask? I don't, think, I don't think we had that, unfortunately. We're not <laughs> as cool. <laughs> okay. All right, but if, 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 if Ruth's background, Chevy was, you know, I mean, Cambridge doesn't get more prestigious than that. You had a lot of practical, uh, a practical experience that you've just been detailing. Mm -hmm. How much would you say advice to, to kids watching this is important to, to actually get your, your hands oily if you want to be an engineer? I think it's, uh, you know, if for, um, for the motorsport, the guys that have got this uh, this kind of passion, they want to work in, in motorsport. I think it's very important as well to uh, understand or to get a practical uh, approach. I think you need uh, you need to have uh, both sides. And uh, also, I would say that it's it's really good to have like the opportunity to go straight from university to, uh, to uh, from university to F1. But it's also good if you do all the steps and you see. Um, how a small structure works and uh, what is needed to get a, a racing team working and also to understand like um, the drivers or it part like when you work in go-kart everything is uh, you have got less people uh, the chassis everything looks simple even if it's quite complicated as well so I think is uh, is very good it's not only about F1 I think it's important if you have got the opportunity to do a few steps before the, before F1 is giving you a, a very valid and wide knowledge of uh, of the industry. And I think that needs to go together with the people that uh, they are more theoretical or uh, theoretical or like Ruth that uh, is all on numbers. I think you need both uh, kind of approaches to uh, to work well together. And Shelley, what about subjects at school? For maybe some, some younger kids watching this, what, what subjects at school would you recommend? For me, it's all, uh, what I like is when I did uh, mechanical engineering, all the physics and um, uh, all the mechanics, that was really something that I tried to, like in Spain now, everything has been changing and even all the universities, I didn't have any kind of study like, uh, directly to uh, automotive. It was like generic mechanical engineering and uh, but then trying to uh, understand and try to apply what you uh, what you see at school at the university how you apply that to uh, to the real world and especially when you go racing and uh, just trying to uh, find yourself a way to explain everything is happening on track you know, it's always one the way how uh, i try to approach it since i was working in gokar is uh, what's happening with the chassis what the driver is saying Try to explain uh, on a physical way what's what's going on there. Why is he saying that? That's on the way how uh, I always um, do it and try to find also an explanation on the data. Just trying to visualize uh, what they say, the drivers. Okay, and Ruth, talk to us about the STEM subjects. Uh, is it science? It's been ages since I went to school. Science, technology, engineering, and maths, right? And uh, yeah, is that the ones? Is that it? Oh, yeah, so, so, um, so the first thing is if you want to be an engineer in really anything, even Formula One as well, you want to make sure when you're doing your GCSEs, um, you try and do your triple science rather than the double science options. So that's one thing that will give you a big advantage um, and also make it a bit easier when you get on to A-levels later as well. Um, when you come to kind of picking your A-levels, um, most engineering courses would like maths, physics, further maths if you'd like to do some more maths um, but you want to have a kind of balance of at least three out of your four to be uh, STEM subjects as you said um, 
And then if you can do what Chevy says in terms of kind of complement that with a bit of experience, that's great. There's obviously different areas of the UK and the world where it's easier to go find go-karting tracks or have access to things. I grew up in the centre of London, so there was very little active kind of motor racing and things like that that I could kind of get my hands on growing up. Um, which is why, as I mentioned earlier, when I got to university, um, the formula student programme um, was really great to kind of complement the math side of, uh, of the work that is kind of concentrated on the course with actually putting things together. Because just as Chevy says, it's, it doesn't matter if you make something that's perfect mathematical, you can't screw a bolt around the corner and you have to be able to fit something together and you have to be able to actually make it work in the real world. And, and when you put those two things together, it's, uh, it's, that's, that's really what engineering is. Are there some other universities that are good for uh, getting experience and in getting into motorsport? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there's, if you can just look through the kind of LinkedIn profiles these days um, of really senior people in Formula One and also more junior people in Formula One, um, you can see which universities they've been to. You can actually see what courses and what grades they've got. And it's a, it's a really good uh, way of actually seeing what the, the next generation of people that are maybe graduates now in certain teams or maybe people that are 10 years older than that, um, what universities they went to. So um, the, the internet is a really powerful tool in order to be able to to see potentially what courses um, are out there and what courses there's already people that have been hired from um, but I think it's it's also to do with kind of how much you try as well it's not just going to one university and that's going to let you open doors when you do come to applying for jobs you've got to apply for a lot of jobs as with everything um, very rarely people get the, the first interview <laughs> Okay, and um, what happens then, Chevy, a lot of people ask um, whether they're, if, if they're at college or at university, should they stay in, uh, they do their degree into the world, the racing world and try and get work, or should they do some sort of postgraduate diploma? What would you say uh, your advice be on that? Yeah, now a lot of people sometimes they ask me what is, uh, what is best is to do a uh, one of these uh, masters or go to a small team or, or should they do their thesis dedicated to uh, something related to motorsport. I think, you know, as I said, at uh, my time I didn't have the opportunity to do any of these uh, masters. It was nothing about uh, motorsport. I think you can go either way. Uh, probably now it will be easier to find uh, to do one of these masters and get a bit of a wide uh, overview on the motorsport but if someone hasn't got the opportunity i would say that it's still very valid if you can find any uh, position as uh, just uh, to learn in a small team either go car or formula 3 or any kind of uh, these uh, promotional uh, championships that will be already i think valid to get the uh, experience and to uh, get the knowledge um, yeah, I think either way, for me, uh, will be valid at the moment. What do you think, Ruth? 50-50? What would your advice be? I would say it really depends what part of Formula One you're interested in. Um, are you going wanting to be um, an aero engineer where there's certain specific effects that if you have a PhD that could give you an edge in terms of applying or do you want to be an engineer at the track where actually, as Jevy says, um, potentially having a more kind of, let's say, um, experience um, in smaller teams could help you. So I think it really depends on, on what role you want to do um, and also what, um, what PhDs or, or are available. Um, in the UK, most of the engineering courses are, um, are four-year courses with a one-year master's um, stuck onto them. Um, so it's, a, it's an easier decision for most uh, UK students because they tend to automatically enroll in a four-year degree and then you come out with, uh, with a master's and a bachelor's um, as one of it. Obviously, if you do it separately, that's another year. So I think it also depends where you're coming from um, and where you uh, where you're. Um, uh, let's say basis comes from in terms of what you're going to end up doing afterwards. Okay and what about the other positions on the pit wall and in in the garage? Um, Ruth do you find that there are people who've come from all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of university courses or schools that are doing all sorts of things or do people tend towards the either engineering or aeronautical engineering or mechanical engineering something like that? 
Well, that is one of the great things about Formula One is you have people that have done all sorts of STEM courses, even within groups. You'll have people that have um, got engineering degrees, which is generally the most popular, but then you'll have mathematics degrees. Um, computer science is another um, very popular uh, degree um, and um, even some like natural sciences, so physics or even chemistry. Formula One is more about the way that you attack a problem um, and it's about working a problem and it's about finding a solution and usually the tools we have to do this are often simulation based um, so that actually lends itself to a whole host of degrees because it's not necessarily the knowledge that you learn in the degree itself but you're learning how to learn you're learning how to attack a problem um, and how to solve things quickly and hopefully not get panicked right and what about that. um yeah what, carry on Chevy. Yeah, and what it would say is, you know, then you, you really need a solid study in what we said before, maths, physics, and then it's how you will learn to apply that to the reality. That's what it, uh, it counts. That's why, uh, you know, then what you have studied, if you are solid on that, then the years you will spend in Formula One or in motorsport, it will give you uh, the knowledge how you will use your knowledge to apply to the reality and get a good result. Okay, so finally you two, would you, I don't know, would you recommend the job? Um, obviously you would because otherwise you, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it yourselves, but what is it, let's, let's put it a different way. What is it a, a, a about the job that you do that you would recommend that's particularly rewarding, that you enjoy doing the most and that gives you the, the, the best thrill? Chevy first. Is job that you you learn every day as i said because uh, you never you never stop it's always a chance that you can do something better and different and that's something that is very uh, motivating um, you need to be very competitive and you need to be prepared to uh, your job is part of your life a bit if if you are prepared to do like this i think that's the job you uh, you want uh, Formula One, especially with the amount of races we do, the amount of traveling, is something that it takes a big part of your life and uh, is very good because when the result is good, then you really feel proud of it. At the same time, sometimes uh, it doesn't go on your way and it will be quite painful, but that's, uh, that's what it is. And you need to uh, don't give up and you keep pushing and then time comes around and it gets better again. And this kind of a lifestyle is what uh, what I like and what people is doing motorsport, I think, is what they're looking for. It's definitely, it's not, uh, you don't get bored. It's not consistency. And Ruth, you know, you've worked for some of the most famous names in motor racing, Alfa Romeo, for Haas F1, and for, of course, for Scuderia Ferrari. They don't come much more famous than that. Um, how rewarding is it and... Um, and, and what is it you love? And, and, and a thought also uh, for girls at school who, who might not have considered Formula One or a race, race car engineering as a, as, a, as a destination that was possible for them. Well, for me, there's something magic about a Formula One team. And when you achieve something and you can be part of something that's bigger than you, um, and that's Combined with what Jerry says, that's the thing that makes Formula One so addictive and such an ever-changing thing because you really do get to see your part fit into the big picture. And then when you have a, a, a good day or a good championship or a, or a really good, even like a small moment, it, it, there's this huge sense of kind of, you know, pride and relief often. Um, and, the ones to get the, and when you get those moments on your own um, individually, it's, it's one thing, but when you actually get it and you're kind of surrounded by happy faces and people together, that is something really special. And if you look across all sports, it's, it's the same. You know, you see pictures of people jumping around together, um, you know, like kind of crying with like happiness. And, and that magic that you have in a Formula One uh, team is something that certainly with STEM subjects, it's quite a unique place to be because normally the the sports element is quite far removed from let's say the technological developments or people doing the coding or people doing the analysis um, and for me the great thing about formula one is you're there on the front line 
you're able to kind of use your math skills, use your uh, teamwork, use your coding skills, and then you get to go to the race and you get to see it every two weeks or every week. Um, and that kind of feedback loop of whether you're doing a good job or a bad job, um, as Chevy says, it's a lifestyle and it is, it really does make you know when you're doing a good job, makes you know when you're doing a bad job. Um, and it definitely pushes you forward in order to try to get the best out of yourself and also get the best out of the people around you. Yeah. And just going back to that female participation, uh, that female participation, Ruth, you know, actually we do see quite a lot of female aer um, strategists, don't we? There's Hannah Schmitz at Red Bull, there's Bernie Collins at uh, Racing Point, uh, yourself as well. So, so is that particularly a mass thing? Is it that, um, well, there's an old joke that women can multitask better than men. Is it, is it thinking outside the, the, the parameters of, of that? Is, is it... Well, I would say it's a shame because there's, uh, there's 10 pit bulls. So statistically, there should be at least half women. So I don't think we're quite there yet, to be honest, if we're going to have equal representation. Um, no, I think the main thing with Formula One is letting people know they're welcome. You know, it, it, it's about that when people watch a, the TV or play a computer game, that they see people that are like them and they feel like they're welcome and they're able to come into that sport. And it's so important that we have that at the grassroots level with girls, um, with people that maybe don't come from the, um, from the background of, that Formula One's typically been from. Um, you know, Jevy came from Spain, where she said there was a lot smaller amounts of Formula One there um, and in other countries than there was in the UK. So I think it's really about advertising ourselves as a sport and saying, look, we want the best people. We don't care where you've come from in the world. We don't really care what gender you are. Um, and we are welcome and we are open. And if you're good, you'll come. You'll come here and you'll have a great career. Um, and I think that's what, um, as Formula One, um, we've made steps towards and we should continue um, pushing because the car doesn't care and the stopwatch doesn't care who you are, where you've come from. And that's a great thing about it. They just want to be, you just want to be the best. Um, so we don't really mind if you're male or female. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, listen, thank you both so much for your insights. Um, uh, it's a strange period we have now, of course, it's what, mm -hmm. approaching June and uh, we haven't got the season up and go, uh, going yet. Um, how are you both uh, g coping with the withdrawal symptoms? Chevy, are you keen to get going again? Yes, we started uh, this week on Monday, we started the, the work again and already just uh, it's been too long. I don't think I've ever spent so much time uh, at home since uh, I left university. That in some way is also good for the family because I've got two kids, but I want to, uh, I want to go racing as soon as possible and I hope we can go in July. And then, Ruth, you've got lots of mental energy, free now and fresh. Yeah, I think um, what we're looking forward to from the strategy side um, is potentially with this rejigged calendar, there's um, slight changes to the season, potentially having more than one the race at the same uh, track, races at a different part of the year than when they normally may be. Um, so I think from a strategy point of view, um, it could be quite an interesting one. Um, and I think everybody working in Formula One is looking forward to going back as soon as we can safely um, and go back racing. Okay, well, listen, as I say, thank you very much for sharing your insights. I'm sure you've given uh, some guidance and some help to some, uh, some kids set on uh, a career in Formula One, really helping them along their way. So uh, Chevy Pujola, Ruth Buscombe, thank you very much from the Alfa Romeo, uh, Sauber, Orland team. And uh, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.